Hey Siri, play me some dinner music. All right. Yo, what'd you decide on that camera? And don't give me that BS about autofocus. You know you don't need it. I've got the Sony in the cart, and unless you convince me otherwise, I'm pulling the trigger after dinner. Siri, stop the music. Really? You too? Yeah, I need to place an order for delivery. Honestly, you just can't win with these YouTube filmmakers because it's like, hey, I don't need autofocus. And now all of a sudden I need autofocus because now you're a YouTuber. So are you a YouTuber or are you a cinematographer? Make up your goddamn mind. So in the last video, I asked you guys to leave in the comments some log lines for a short scene or film or something like that that I could make on the channel. And I did it. I made one of those scenes, basically a short film. I mean, it's four minutes long. It has a beginning, middle, and end. It's basically a short film, right? It just happens to be about me. And you know, it's not like super, not a super dramatic piece by any means, but I learned a lot making this little film um, already. Just in this one little, exercise I've already learned a lot and that's what we're gonna talk about in this video. The film idea actually came from Patrick Tommaso and no I'm not being biased with this. Yes he's in the video um, but I was going through all the comments and his actually did stand out to me as something that I could accomplish myself and I thought the whole air fryer reference was kind of funny given that Patrick and I are always talking about air fryers on Twitter. So I thought it'd be a good subject to actually try to make into a film because I could actually pull from it myself actually having an air fryer and cooking in an air fryer. And then as I was kind of writing it it kind of turned into this thing that we could actually tack Patrick 
music into at the end as a little twist. So the log line that he actually put in the comments was your air fryer becomes a portal to send messages to yourself from the future. Now I wanted to take this concept and turn it into something that actually made sense for my own uh, way of storytelling and so rather than talking to myself from the future it ended up being Patrick communicating with me through a toaster to my air fryer. So to start making this film I of course had to basically write it out into a script format and the first thing I did was take the two characters and give them motivations and wants to create conflict between them the two. So basically my character wants to buy the A7S III because I need autofocus in my life. Now I didn't actually buy the A7S III, but it was just something that me and Patrick have been talking about a lot. Like should I buy an FX3 and A7S III so I can have autofocus and full frame to be able to use that kind of stuff on the channel. I haven't actually done that, but um, I thought that'd be kind of funny because we're always talking about that. So that's like my motivation is I'm trying to get the Sony A7S III and basically he's trying to stop me. So that's our initial conflict for the story. The backbone of the story is drama which comes from conflict so that's where I started and I would say the first lesson that I learned when making this film was I needed to plan better there wasn't a lot of time to kind of make this film I have other stuff going on in my life so although I did script the film out properly I did not do a full shot list and a full like storyboard of it um, which would be really helpful because it can help you kind of find the, the groove and the flow of the shots and how you might edit them together later if you prepare all this stuff beforehand you're gonna have a much easier time when you're filming it I did not do that. I thought that it would be a simple enough scene to do um, kind of off the cuff with a pretty good idea here in my head. Um, and I was right. It wasn't that hard, but I definitely did miss some stuff. So lesson one, plan a little bit, little bit better. Definitely storyboard or shot list it to make sure you have a flow of shots that makes sense for a narrative format. Something that you don't have to do quite as much in the commercial world. Um, I can wing it, I can go with my gut a little bit more with the commercial world, but I was not able to do that with the narrative filmmaking. You definitely need a plan or your stuff's not gonna make sense when you start to edit. So what ended up, ha ended up actually happening was I filmed quite a bit. Uh, I had Easton Oliver again on, help me out on the channel. He filmed some shots for me that I couldn't operate myself, some of the camera movement um, and he was there to help me the whole time which was great so thank you Easton but I filmed for like basically a full day with him um, and then when I started editing it together I realized that there was a few shots that we weren't able to get and I was gonna have to get those by myself um, but also once I started putting it together it was actually kind of nice because I could find the holes in the gaps where I needed maybe like a different reaction on my face or something like that and so I filmed the rest of it by myself the next day to be able to fill in those little those little gaps uh, to make the story actually make sense but I think if I would have planned it out thoroughly, I wouldn't have had to just fill in those gaps. I just would have got everything the first time we shot. Something else uh, I learned when you're filming on a set, it's, you know, in a commercial environment or something like that. A lot of the times you aren't in a location for super long. Basically you can light a shot, get the shot, light a shot, get the shot. And continuity isn't as much of a big deal. But with this, we shot for like, I don't know, five or six hours. And this has happened to me quite a bit. I actually did this on another short film. I shot in one house all day. I broke down that film on the channel before. and. It's really hard to deal with lighting. You, you know, I always talk about controlling your lighting, control your lighting, control your lighting. Well, it was just me and Easton. It was gonna be impossible to control the lighting outside all day. And so it's definitely gonna be a little bit of a continu like continuity error in, in the film with the lighting because like lights are gonna be coming through windows at different times. Even when I walk outside, I filmed that in two different days. So I, when I take the air fryer outside to throw it, that's one shot where Easton helped me one day. And then the next day I had to film the other shot of me actually throwing it, which I did all by myself. Um, but I think that shot turned out really well. Well, it was actually a static shot that I ended up adding just a little bit of hand motion in post just to make it feel like someone actually filmed it. Um, kind of to keep that flow of events, keep that kind of momentum going. So that's very difficult. If you can control the light as much as possible, maybe even do a full blackout on all the windows and then put your own lights, augment them in yourself. That's probably the best way of doing it. Or maybe even filming at night. Whatever you can do to control your light to make sure you don't have these continuity errors, especially when you're a small crew like that, you definitely want to do that. Now that's something I already knew for sure, but it was something that I knew I wasn't able to control and I was just trying to hope that it would work and it was hard. And so speaking of lighting, I didn't actually do a lot of lighting on this one. I actually, because it was just me and Easton, I didn't go full out on the cinematography like I normally do on the channel because this was just an exercise of just doing the whole process right. It wasn't trying to be, you know, perfect at everything that we did. It was just trying to exercise how to make an entire short film by ourselves. It was less about the quality over the actual exercise itself. So for this one, I use an Aperture 120D and the Aperture uh, China Ball, the Lantern 
um, modifier and I had that on a rolling stand and then I could roll that around and basically just wherever the sun might be coming from or to add a little bit of shape I would just put up that lantern in the room you know far side of my face just to give some shape and to fill the room with light which was really handy for most of the shots when the sun was just kind of out doing its thing but once we got later in the day it made it much harder um, and I had to basically boost the light up a lot more and you can actually see where it's kind of spilling around the room it looks a little bit more uh Definitely looks a little bit more like I lit it, um, but with some power windows and posts and stuff like that, I think I did a pretty good job of making it match. If you didn't know where the light was coming from or that it was fake, it's not that easy to tell in my opinion, especially from a narrative standpoint. That stuff isn't quite as a big of a deal. You wouldn't be paying attention to the story and less of the lighting. So in the next film, I'm definitely gonna try harder with that. Um, probably talk more about how to set a vibe and a mood for a film, whereas this one was a little bit less about that. It was more just focusing on the storytelling. And so speaking of filming it, actually this was, I really just wanted an excuse to use the red Komodo my friend Nick was in town with his red Komodo, which was great, which I'll be talking about that more in another video. Um, but I wanted an excuse to use that camera. So we actually shot this entire film on the red Komodo, uh, which was an interesting experience diving into shooting a short film with a camera that I've never shot on before. So I did some tests with it first to kind of figure out how to use the camera. And, and then we ended up shooting it all on this. It was kind of nice actually, it has a wider sensor than my pocket, kind of a bigger 17 by nine sensor, um, which was nice because we were shooting in that 240 aspect ratio, the cinemascope aspect ratio. Um, and it gave us a little bit more real estate on the side to be able to do that. The Komodo also has autofocus, which I thought would be handy. And we tried to use it a couple times, but you can actually see in the one shot where I'm standing in the kitchen, the wide, I filmed that by myself with autofocus and it did not do a great job. But we'll talk more about the Komodo in another video. Uh, but that being said, it does have autofocus. We did try it, uh, it worked a couple times, but it was not perfect for us when shooting this film. So we actually ended up using manual focus the whole time, but we did shoot on Canon lenses just in case we wanted to use autofocus. So we had the Sigma 18 to 35 as our main lens, which is just like the zoom lens it would be really easy just to kind of frame the shots really quick to make it just more efficient rather than using my vintage lenses and then for all the gimbal shots we actually use the Ronin S with the Komodo on it and then we used a Canon 40 millimeter pancake lens actually which is super handy it's so small it balances on the gimbal really easily and it has autofocus in case we needed to use that I was much more practical in making this film than I am on my other stuff because uh, like I said it was more about the filmmaking process altogether and less about the quality even though I feel like the quality of the film is still pretty good, but you guys be the judge of that. Let me know in the comments below what you thought of it. Did you feel like it looked professional? Do you feel like it looked like a movie? What would you have done differently to make it look more like a movie? We'll talk about that more in another video for sure, because we're gonna be doing a lot more scenes like this in the future. Yeah, but actually before I move forward, remember um, to leave more log lines in the comments of this video of scene ideas. And remember, keep it simple enough that I can maybe find a location, do it myself. Um, I don't have a full crew for all these things. There's no money for that right now, but hopefully we can get some money for that soon. Sponsors, reach out to me, let's work together, let's make something happen, because we are gonna make a lot more of these this type of content on the channel. Leave some log lines, some scene ideas in the comments below so I can have more ideas for the next video. So something else I wanted to do with this was to make sure it didn't have too much special effects, um, but we did have a couple gags in there. We obviously have the toaster oven. My air fryer kind of looks like a toaster oven, so that's why I ended up using toast as our uh, prop for most of this, as the communication device, just because that would be easier. And initially when I went into it, I was like, you know what, this is gonna be really easy. I'm just going to take some foil, cut out, like make a stencil, put words on it, and then just throw it in the toaster oven. Don't do it, Spencer. Don't do it. That didn't work, so I tried my pizza oven. That didn't work very well either. It just wasn't coming out clean enough. Then I even went to my wife's shop and got a torch, a blow torch, and tried to blow a torch in letters, and that didn't work as well. None of them really translated, so I ended up using a Sharpie uh, for the words. And I used, I only had a blue Sharpie, and I just desaturated some of that blue in post to make it look black, uh, which was lame, because I only had a blue Sharpie. But we were running out of time, so I had to use a blue Sharpie. What do you do? So that was the first gag, was obviously to take the bread and write words on them. Nothing too special in the end. I would have been way cooler if I could have actually toasted those into the toast, but you know, uh, it was an experiment. The next thing was the actual air fryer itself. So what I ended up doing, I wasn't gonna throw my $200 air fryer out the door, obviously. I ended up going to a thrift shop and buying a toaster oven that looked very similar. Toaster oven acquired. I think it actually worked really well. Actually, the toaster oven's black and has silver accents, whereas my air fryer was completely silver. But I think in the moment, when you're watching it in the film and I throw it, you can't really tell a difference unless you're looking really close. Um, it was actually kind of handy. I threw it, I think. I think I did the take six times until I feel like I really got it to fall how I want it to fall and to frame. And it kept kind of breaking every time I threw it. So that last time I threw it, I actually used that last, that sixth take. When I threw it and it fell, 
it was already kind of beat up and broken, which kind of made it look even more real and more dramatic. Um, so that was pretty fun. I shot that one just in regular speed on the Komodo, but then I, I got this clip here with the X-T3 at 120 frames per second of me throwing it. That was hard. I had to film myself and the behind the scenes myself and be in it and acting in it and then throw the toaster oven without hitting the Komodo with the toaster oven because I didn't want to throw the toaster oven at the Komodo. That's not my Komodo, although it is supposed to be a crash, crash cam. So it could have been kind of interesting to put it through that test, but I wasn't going to do that. It wasn't my camera. So I did not throw the toaster all the way. I actually backed it up quite a bit and zoomed in a little bit in post. That's, you know, we have the 6K resolution. We could zoom in a little bit. But I like that shot. I like how it cuts together. Like I said, I added a little handheld motion on that static shot in post just to make it to match the shot before it which was the was the handheld shot running outside which Eason good job on the handheld shot it turns out really well so I did something a little interesting with this when it comes to the blocking of the scene and I want you guys to tell me in the comments below if you felt like this was jarring or if it worked but normally when you're setting up a scene between two people in this scenario it'd be between the air fryer and myself you create a line of action to film on right so you can you know one character needs to be looking from left to right and the other character needs to be looking from right to left that way they're talking to each other so it's like the air fryer and me. But what I was able to do is one thing I would do these kind of POV shots, they'd be straight on. Um, that's where I used basically a midpoint of the story to shift the story and make it more dramatic. And uh, once I cut to those reactions and then you find, I finally see the toast and it says don't on it, then I come, I swap the line. I basically jump the line by using one of those straight on cuts as a transition. So it, I kind of get rid of the line and then I bring it back, but I, I flop sides to kind of just move the story along, you know, it was all basically in one location. So I thought if I flipped the line, it would kind of spice up the locations and make it look a little bit different as we move forward in the story. Tell me what you think uh, about that. Do you feel like that worked? Did you notice it? Were you like, oh, now he jumped the line or did not feel like I jumped the line since I used the transition shot of the POVs which were straight on. So another technique that I did use in this that I thought worked out pretty well. Um, so like when I say lessons learned here, it's actually a lesson that I was just experimenting did did this thing work? And it did. I actually used Musicbed. I went to the Musicbed website and while I was writing, I try to get some music ideas in mind for each scene, for each part of the story. And so I actually found music and tried to listen to music as I was writing to kind of get me in the groove of the story. And that way I would have something to kind of think about while I was filming and editing. That worked out pretty well. I found that first opening song, that kind of like spunky song that I was kind of walking to when I was going into the kitchen. That kind of helps sets the tone for for me, what's going on, um, and that, that, that long shot, we have the music kind of pull us through all that, you know, just to add a vibe to that opening shot and throw us right into the story. And then of course I wanted to find something that was a little bit more tense after that as the scene started to get dramatic and it started to shift, so I found a song for that. But then when it was in post, actually, when I found the song for the handheld part where I actually throw the air fryer, I needed something that kind of jungly feeling, something kind of like upbeat and barbaric because I was about to throw this toaster oven uh, out into my yard. So I've actually found that song later though. Um, but that was just kind of fun. And then Patrick had a good idea of using the same song from the beginning to throw into his scene, just to kind of have that kind of funny, creepy vibe, like they're, they're connected in some way. It's actually a good transition to talk about today's sponsor, which is where I got all my music, and that's Musicbed. Ever since I started this filmmaking journey, I've been using Musicbed for all my music licensing needs. What's great about Musicbed is that all their music is handpicked and curated for the best sounding music for video possible. And what I mean by that is that it doesn't ever sound like generic stock music. If you're looking for something truly cinematic or a chill beat to put behind your video, Musicbed's browser and search functions make it super easy to find the soundtrack you're looking for. Now I'm a simple person, so once I found the band Makeup and Vanity set through the browser page, I was hooked. I've basically been milking their catalog of music since I started this YouTube channel. Musicbed is not a royalty-free music platform. Each song is approved on the back end automatically using their custom sync ID, which almost instantly approves your license when you upload a video. So if you want your first month free with Musicbed, use the code SPENCER at check out. And I want to thank Musicbed for sponsoring this video. So yeah, so I feel like to open the film, I thought it'd be really fun to throw us into it as quick as possible. So we used a gimbal shot for that. That was a good way of creating motion and showing off the house. So it establishes where we're at really fast. Fast. It establishes me and it establishes what I'm doing. I'm clearly about to cook dinner. I'm probably gonna use a cooking device for that, which would have been the air fryer. And so that really sets the pace and the mood, throws us right into it. But then we switched to the tripod just to be able to have static, nice controlled shots for the rest of the film. And that way, when we did 
have more drama happen, we could disrupt that drama by going to handheld. So I actually stabilize the opening part of my reaction to the air fryer before I throw it outside. And then I cut into the handheld. So it looks like we're on a tripod basically and then move into handheld to disrupt that flow, to add that drama. And then I run outside, throw the air fryer, of course, and then it lands. And then when I come back inside, we're back on the Ronin. So we're kind of meeting it two in the middle. So rather being handheld, rather than being on a tripod, we still have some movement. There's still some momentum there. And then it comes comes in. Thank you, Easton, for, for manning the Ronin on this. Comes in and then I kind of settle there on the ground for that punchline at the end of ordering delivery um, while still showing the toast in the foreground, you know, just as a reminder of what just happened, basically. So as far as sound goes on this and sound design, I just actually had a lob taped inside my shirt for all of us. That way we didn't have to set up a boom and move it around for every shot. I mean, there's quite a few shots in this, this little film. I mean, it's four minutes long but there are, I don't know, there's gotta be like, what, 40 shots or something? Maybe a little less than that, but there's quite a few shots in here. Um, and so we didn't wanna have to move the, the, the mic around for all that, so I just used a lob the whole time. And I feel like the lob worked really well for this because it's an omnidirectional mic. We were able to pick up other sounds that were happening. Like if I was playing with the toaster oven, it could pick up that audio and we didn't have to worry about all that later. Although I did go back later with the lob and I uh, basically got little foley to add in. So like me walking across the house for the opening shot, actually just took the lob right by my feet, walked through my house and opened the fridge and just kind of timed it just right for that. And I got the, the beeps from the air fryer with the lob after that and some room tone and stuff like that. So I was able just to go back later and get some more audio just to kind of make it feel more real and more right later rather than having to get it all while we were filming. That's called getting Foley audio. That's something that you see a lot in Hollywood films. Half the time the, the audio that you're hearing is not even from the set day unless it's dialogue. And even sometimes dialogue is replaced later. So that was really easy for me just to go around the house with the mic, get some extra audio sound so I could control those and just I just threw those back in, in post. So then of course Patrick got to do his scene so I wrote that separate as like a bonus scene basically even though it does really kind of bring the whole story uh, full circle. But he, he bought a little toaster for this so thanks Patrick for buying a toaster. And then he lit his a little bit more creepy right a little more darker mood with the with just the tungsten light on his face. So basically he was kind of like the villain in this. Uh, he was the one that was trying to get me to not buy the Ace. 7S3. So his was lit a little bit different and a different mood, which was really fun to contrast my kind of daylight vibe that I had going on. And he actually shot his his part on the Pocket 4K with a speed booster, I believe, and the 18 to 35. So I sent him the script and he kind of was able to get some shots and some coverage for me. And then I was able to edit that together myself just based on the shots that he got. And I think it turned out pretty well. So thanks Patrick Tomaso for helping me out and actually coming up with the idea for the short and then being in it with me. I really appreciate it. If you don't watch Patrick's channel, definitely go check that out. I'll have a link to his channel in the description below. All right, so what did you think of the first scene? Is this some content that you guys are really into? Because I want to make a movie, guys. I want to start making short films, practice so I can make a movie one day, hopefully in the near future. So we're going to keep doing this on the channel. Don't worry, there'll be more cinematography stuff coming up too. Like I said, we're going to talk about the Red Komodo here soon. Um, but let me know in the comments if you're liking this content because I'm going to keep doing it. And if there's anything that you guys want to see or you have questions about from how I shot this, please let me know in the comments below about that too. Maybe I can address that in a later video um, and kind of address some of those like specific concerns you have about shooting narrative projects. Projects. And of course I can go deeper into some of this stuff if you have questions on it. Put some more log lines in there for new scenes, put your questions in there. I'd love to hear from you guys. I'd love to hear what you think about this new series. And if you want to see more content like this, definitely subscribe to the channel because there's going to be more of this coming up in the future. And if you wouldn't mind giving me a thumbs up on this video, that'll help get more people to see this video so I can get more of this kind of content made. Maybe some sponsors will hit us up and we can maybe make a short film, maybe make a movie. Maybe I can get you guys involved with that. That'd be something that'd be really fun. So until next time guys, I'm Sunter Sakurai, see ya.